Welcome to the uh, fifth annual Shirley Povich uh, workshop, and we've added Jamboree this year because we wanted to attract some uh, high school students who might not yet be committed uh, to journalism and sports broadcasting, but might be interested in the subject. And uh, we have, as you can see over to the left, a, a wonderful panel. But before we uh, uh, get to the panel, uh, I'd like to introduce some people who will uh, make some opening remarks, and we will start out with the Dean of the Philip Merrill College of Journalism, Dean Kevin Close. Dean? Hi, George. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm a newspaper guy uh, who also wandered into radio and did some television. I don't blog, I don't tweet, but I sure read sports all the time, and I pay attention to it. And I wanted to just uh, start out with the one reality about sports journalism, whether you like it or don't like it, whether you read it or watch it, it's an amazing place for history to come just right out at us. And it gives reporters and journalists the opportunity to both go forward in time, talk about what's coming up, but also in unique ways, in very amusing and funny ways, to go back real fast. Yesterday, for example, in Boston at Fenway Park, Fenway Park celebrated its 100th anniversary. In a competing newspaper, a competing news organization called the New York Times, <laughs> forget the name now, they had a photograph in their sports section of a woman named Caroline Kennedy throwing ceremonial baseballs out to some of the great uh, previous Red Sox players. And the caption, Tiny little caption in tiny little letters says that Caroline Kennedy's great grandfather threw out the first ceremonial baseball when Fenway Park was inaugurated a hundred years ago. What does that mean? It means almost nothing to many, many people, but it tells us something about continuity in our own world, and it tells us about the history of a place like Fenway Park. How many of us have been in Fenway Park? I was there on the, in the last game that Ted Williams played in which he hit a home run, 61. Yeah. Let me read one other thing that's really neat that I think. Yeah, this is the kind of thing you find in the sports section in, in great news organizations. You hear it on, you hear it in sports broadcasts, you read it on blogs and so forth. But I just wanted to pick this thing out. It's, it's, look, there's all kinds of data in this thing today. But here's one that just I just loved. You'll never find this anywhere else except on the sports pages. This is, this is reporting about baseball games yesterday in the, in the MLB. Jays turned three. Toronto turned its first triple play yesterday since September 21, 1979. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> Who cared? But what is a triple play? It's a kind of summation of excellence in a particular sport in which individuals working together as a team do something that is so hard to do that they actually keep track of it in the, in the sports nerds, whom we all are somehow in our heads, who want to know what's the last time this happened. So there's a kind of continuity there in one line of very small type. But let me just go on a little bit more here, because it gets even more interesting. So, so they turned there, their, their, the last time they did triple play was September 1, 1979, against the Yankees. This is just a little squib. Post Kansas City, this is where the game happened yesterday. So the Jays were in Kansas City playing the Royals. And this little squib says, in Kansas City, host Kansas City had runners on first and second in the third inning when Eric Hosmer lined out to first baseman Adam Lynn, who stepped on the bag to double off Unieski Pettencourt. He then fired to shortstop Unia Escobar, who caught Alex Gordon off second. That's how the triple play occurred. Fabulous. Just as simple as that. One more sentence. Al Cowens was the last Royal to hit into a double play on June 19, 1979, against the A's. Just like that, you've gotten, you've gone back into history twice in this extraordinary, concise, declarative factual sentence. It's the essence of journalism, a single declarative description, carefully observed, carefully recorded, and then carefully told to others. It is the essence of journalism. It's, the, it's one of the great phenomena of sports journalism, is you can get this kind of information so quickly, so clearly, so concisely. And it tells us so much about a 
about the way human beings work, work and live across decades. Thank you very much. George, take it away. Being close. Uh, <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Kevin Blackstone, uh, sports columnist and also uh, uh, panelist for uh, ESPN's Around the Horn and a member of the Philip uh, Merrill College faculty. Uh, Kevin? Hey, welcome. Glad to see everybody made it. Uh, glad to see uh, some return faces. Cool. Um, hope you're all enthused about this. Um, we certainly are. Um, Sports journalism is, uh, is, is a great thing. It's a lot of fun, number one. Get to go to a lot of games, uh, get to interact with a lot of people. And number two, I think it's pretty important. Um, you just look at, uh, I always tell one of my classes at the beginning of the year, that if you just look at the top ten stories that <clears throat> AP, Associated Press, kind of list every year, um, usually three, maybe four of those right at the top are all sports stories, certainly for last year. Uh, the biggest sports story of the year was a scandal that happened at Penn State, uh, which won a uh, crime reporter um, up at a small newspaper in Pennsylvania the, uh, uh, and, her, and the staff, the uh, Pulitzer Prize for uh, local reporting uh, just earlier this week. So uh, sports reporting is uh, not just fun and games, uh, but it's important. It's uh, critical stuff. And I'm glad that you folks are uh, enthused enough um, to get up early in the morning on a Saturday when it's beautiful outside and come up here and uh, rub shoulders and keep your ears and eyes open to listen to some professionals who uh, do it uh, very well and have been doing it very well for a long time in a lot of different um, avenues uh, from writing um, to uh, uh, radio to television and now in the new inter internet world that um, we all live in and have been living in now for the last uh, seven, eight, nine, ten years maybe, um, people who do it uh, just on websites and with blogs. Um, so uh, I hope that you all enjoy your day. I um, uh, hope you learn a lot. I uh, hope you make some contacts. Uh, don't be afraid to ask for a business card. Um, write down names, numbers, uh, emails, and stay in contact. Uh, because at the end of the day, of course, we'd love to have you up here to make this place um, even more famous than it is now. So thank you. Uh, next, uh, Sean. Uh, well, uh, Sean Mussenden is here, and he is the uh, director of the Capital News Service. Uh, Sean, why don't you come up for a few for a few moments to uh, tell us about uh, the Capital News Service and. Uh, what it offers uh, for uh, uh, Merrill College students. Sean Musson. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks, George. Um, so uh, here at the Merrill College, we run a nonprofit professional uh, news organization called Capital News Service covering uh, the state of Maryland. Um, and I just want to give a little bit of a, a, a pitch for the program if you're trying to consider maybe where you might want to go to school to get involved with, uh, with uh, a career in sports media. Um, we cover a lot of sports. Um, we cover uh, events on the University of Maryland campus. Uh, we cover uh, um, some professional teams uh, and other colleges in the area. Uh, we write a lot of trend stories about high school and so forth. Um, it's a really great way to build up a lot of good, um, uh, good clips, the kind of things that might get you uh, a job someday in, in sports media. So uh, I'll be around all day. If any of you guys are interested in hearing a little more about it, I'm happy to talk to you. Thank you, Sean. Thanks. Now, this is something really important to know. Professor Blackstone, neither Professor Blackstone, nor Sean, nor me, can admit you to the university. <laughs> and uh, sad to say, you'll have to go through the admissions uh, 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 policies of the University of Maryland. But uh, we're here to help if you have any questions. OK, before we get to the panel, uh, I want to go through the schedule a little bit. And um, uh, you know, and you know, answer any questions you might have. Uh, we're going to have the uh, uh, session uh, right after I finish babbling uh, on sports media, a career for you, uh, which is a, a pack shop session. Uh, at 2 o'clock is blogging with uh, Dan Steinberg of the Washington Post and Mike uh, Tillery for the Starting Five blog. Uh, television production uh, at 2 o'clock 
Aaron Solomon of ESPN's Around the Horn, someone I know and got to come here cheap. So um, uh, three, at 3 o'clock, uh, we were going to have a critique. So if you have any of your work or you want to talk about uh, uh, sports journalism, you want to talk about writing, uh, your sports page, uh, photography, freelancing, uh, we're all going to be here and we'll be glad to talk to you from 3 to 3.50 or at least until the time the Capitals and Bruins face off. <laughs> so all right, without further ado, uh, we're going to uh, start uh, the sports media uh, session of Is This a Career for You? And the moderator will be Kevin Blackstone who has done wonderful work throughout his career, uh, both for uh, a number of newspapers, including uh, the Dallas Morning News, and uh, is now a panelist for Around the Horn and uh, doing uh, columns uh, throughout the country. I want to introduce uh, a former student of ours, Mariel Brady, who is now the junior publicist for CBS Sports Network. Mariel? We can applaud. Is Chartise here yet? Yeah. No, she will be along. Uh, Liz Clark is a, a sports writer for the Washington Post who has covered everything from international tennis to Maryland basketball to Georgetown basketball to NASCAR. She's been with the uh, Charlotte newspaper. She's been with USA Today. And she's been with the Washington Post for more than 10 years. Liz? Um, next is Andy Poland, the sports director of ESPN 980, my favorite radio station, who has had the pleasure of working. I think you developed Tony Kornheiser as a radio personnel. Uh, 14 a years. It was a lot of Michigas. <laughs> Christy Winter Scott is another University of Maryland alum. She's an analyst for Comcast Sportsnet, Raycom, ESPN, Fox Sports. Uh, Christy was an all ACC basketball player and has uh, played professionally and has done really wonderful work in her afterlife from basketball. <laughs> and finally, we added this person. Uh, Jonas Schaefer, the sports editor of the Diamondback, we added Jonas just to see if a University of Maryland student on a Saturday could get up before 11 in the morning. <laughs> Jonas? <laughs> uh, uh, it's been a great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Kevin Blackestone. Well, thanks a lot. Well, I'm going to just get right to it. <clears throat> Figuring out if the sports journalism job is for you. I kind of meandered in this thing. I started in news, went into investigative reporting, went into covering economics, and then somehow morphed into a sports journalist, which I've done for the most of my uh, life. But Andy, Poland, you've been around yeah. in sports forever. How did you know that sports journalism was for you? Well, uh, unlike Christie, I had no athletic ability, so I knew that end of it wasn't for me. But I love sports, and um, you know, it's funny, I think all of us to some degree do this because we like what we cover more than what we actually do to make the money covering it, although we like that as well. And I think if you're going to enter into a career, you should go to something that you're passionate about. You know, people who like to cook become chefs, and you know, hey, if you've been heard, you've heard this before. If you want to make money, be around money. You know, people who understand banking do very well and that sort of thing. But I always liked sports. I wish I was better at it, but I always liked to watch them and uh, and play sports. And so uh, I saw this as an opportunity. You know, I went to American University. Uh, I was on campus for about three days, and there was an organizational meeting for the campus radio station. I thought I'd dabble in it, and before I knew it, that's where I was spending all my time. And the uh, former sports information director at American University was a guy by the name of Mark Splaver. Unfortunately, he died very young, but he was at that time the uh, director of communications for the Washington Bullets, for the Bullets then. And uh, he made passes available for get us for certain games, you know, where there wasn't a lot of media demand. 
And uh, I was 18 years old, and I was standing in the Bullets locker room looking at Elvin Hayes and Wes Unseld, who I'd idolized since I was 10 years old. And I said, this is heaven. I mean, who's, who's not going to want to do this? And so that's what I've been pretty much doing. I've been, uh, I'll be 54 in August. I've been doing this almost 35 years. It's, it's a great way to make a living. And in fact, uh, Liz will talk more about this. The other day when she were, last week was on the Tony Kornheiser show, they were talking about the lottery winners. Tony makes a lot of money now. He's, he's pretty much won the lottery in our business. But he said, uh, he said if he won, he wouldn't quit his job. And I think, I think a lot of us feel the same way. So that's my story. Liz, would you quit your job if you were the Mega Millions winner? No, 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 no. no. You really I, wouldn't. I, you have to think. <laughs> I mean, well, not to go down this road deeply, but, you know, it's a, it's a tough time for newspapers economically, and their future is somewhat unclear. So my hesitation was, how many more years do I have left in newspapers? <laughs> but, but the job, meaning the writing, right. journalism, whether it's sports or something else, I, I would feel lost without it. I mean, in some ways, my life would be much easier, because after all these years, it's still the hardest thing. It... it, it it's very difficult and, um, and a challenge for me, but, but I wouldn't know what to do if I couldn't come up with a story idea or have a curiosity and tell an editor, you know, I think there's a story in, in this. I, I tend to not be as excited about covering games and going to events as trying to learn about the people behind it or the issues behind it, and, and maybe I'll elaborate on that. But, um, but no, I would not. I feel very lucky. Very, very lucky. And you too kind of found your way to sports journalism in... Much like you. Way. Yeah. Um, I, uh, my love was newspapers, reading newspapers um, as a kid. And I was never sure that I could do it myself. But So when I started in newspapers, I entered in the news side and was a news reporter like Kevin, um, Professor Blackstone for about five years and, and made a switch to sports that I thought would be temporary. It was an editor's idea, mainly to cover off the field issues in sports. Um, this was in, in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I thought that would be like a three to five year proposition and I'd go back to news. And that was 25 years ago. It was a long time ago, so I've been, been in sports. Um, but if I could just give one quick example of why I love what I do, why I would never get tired of it, and why, in, in a lot of ways, I'd never master it, which to me is the definition of a great job. You know, you're always striving. Um, it kind of piggybacks on the Dean's opening remarks when he was speaking about sports journalism as a window on the past, you know, very deft and succinct. Um, I've been struck the last 24 hours, there's a particular news story unfolding overseas that kind of tells you why sports is a window on the present and in, often the future. And why, you know, for any parents here, um, if your child wants to be a sports reporter, it's not as limiting as you might think. So the point I'm trying to make is that to be an excellent sports journalist, you have to always be looking for the context of what you're writing about. Um, the example I wanted to give you is about a Formula One race. I don't know if anybody follows auto racing. That's a very exotic, you know, second most popular sport in the world, actually. Um, the most beautiful form of auto racing. Um, they're racing Sunday in Bahrain, this very troubled island nation run by a ruling family. And the island is going through the kingdom through through a unrest similar that's going on um, throughout many countries overseas. Um, so it's a huge controversy whether they should have run this Formula One race or not. So say you were working overseas and you were the AP sports reporter and you were sent to Bahrain to cover this Formula One race on Sunday. You have to do better than be able to describe who won the race and how they won the race. You need to know the backdrop of the issues in Bahrain and why hundreds are protesting. You know, a protester was found dead this morning. What's going to happen on race day? Is there going to be a bomb? Is, is a protester going to run into the track? I mean, this is kind of an epic example, but quite often you might be covering a sporting event where 
political news breaks out, you know, natural disaster breaks out. There was a, an earthquake in the middle of a World Series game maybe 20 years ago that became the story. So sports writing, you must call on everything you know, and you must prepare as best you can, not just to know who's the leading scorer when you cover a game, but, you know, what are the underlying issues afoot? And that's a given if you cover the Olympics, if you cover Wimbledon, Novak Djokovic is from Serbia, what is that like? You know, what, growing up amid a war, I'll stop there. But I'm just a big fan of journalism in general because you're never gonna master it all. You always need to educate yourself better to write the richest possible stories that are different from, here's the score, here's the result. Your stories need to tell the whole picture. Chartiz Burnett has joined us. Good morning. Good morning. I apologize for being late. I kind of got my signals crossed. I thought I wasn't due here until 10, so I apologize. Well, we're glad you, you made it here. I think you didn't need it just before 10. Congratulations. And just uh, share your uh, journey into sports media. Okay. how you got there and where you are now. Um, I'll be very brief because when you've been in the business over two decades, you know, your resume gets really long and your story gets really long. Um, and I don't want to bore you guys, but I went to Georgetown University um, and graduated from Georgetown with a degree in um, foreign languages way back in the day, in 1983. Um, I returned to Georgetown um, in 87. So four years later, I went back to Georgetown to start, really, to begin a career. I my endeavor was to get into public relations and to get into um, media relations and communications um, in a broader sense. And there was an opportunity for me to work in the sports information office. And I started there um, as an admin assistant, which was an amazing um, time for me to learn under two really, really uh, very, very um, accomplished professionals who were the sports information directors um, at the time. One handled men's basketball. Um, and one handled all of the other um, non-revenue sports, about 22 at that time. After four years, um, I had been promoted through the ranks over the course of four years, and I left there in 1991 um, as a sports information director. I was recruited by the commissioner of the National Basketball Association to um, work in a brand new position that was created at the league office in New York, and that was director of media relations. And so I went to the National Basketball Association, moved on from the collegiate ranks, and headed up media relations, um, dealing with all of the publicity for the league, league issues, um, working as a liaison with the uh, various teams in the league. And I was there for a couple of years. I took a brief break to get married and to be a mom, always knowing that I would get back and return to my career. Um, after doing the most important job in the world, and um, the most important thing to me is being a mother. And so I, after about three years, um, I learned about a brand new position, once again, a newly created position, which was back in my hometown of Washington, D.C. I'm a native um, from Washington, and that was with the NFL Players Association, the union that represents all current and former players that's here in Washington. The position was um, a vice president of communications, for the for-profit subsidiary, which was at that time called Players Inc., which is now called NFL Players. And that subsidiary, work, subsidiary works with all of the licensees and sponsors that deal with um, players' images and likenesses. So all the trading card companies, EA, Madden Sports, any video games, any jerseys that you buy, those companies have to secure uh, group licensing rights in order to use NFL players' likenesses and images. We also had television shows at the time. We had events and things like that this year, actually, and which was an amazing ride, as you can imagine. Um, it was just a fantastic, fantastic time for me. I had a fantastic um, um, career there for six years. And then I uh, very briefly went on to work for a friend of mine who had his own PR agency uh, to head up the nonprofit division of uh, Maroon PR, which is located in Columbia, Maryland. Nonprofit is the other side of my life that um, I'm very, very passionate about in terms of um, the social sector and had been a volunteer leader for about 12 years uh, with several organizations, most notably the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And um, I did that for about a year and then I kind of branched out on my, not kind of, but I did branch out on my own last September and I started my own consultancy where I work with nonprofits, I work with sports properties as well, 
So I work with the National Kidney Foundation now. I work with DC United, or actually United for DC, which is their 501c3. I work with NFL Super Bowl Gospel Celebration, which is one of only five events that are sanctioned by the NFL. And um, I'm also a professor here, um, working with um, Mr. Solomon and Professor Blackstone, and um, I also teach at Georgetown University um, in their sports industry management program, and I teach um, communications there, sports PR and communications and media relations. So that's kind of my career in a nutshell. I hope I didn't bore you guys. You guys still wait. <laughs> I see a couple of my stellar students here. Steven's here, um, and I see Josh in the back. So, hi, Josh. <laughs> So Christy, let me guess, because you were a star athlete and you had some interest in journalism, um, when you graduated and your career was over, you were just showered with jobs and offers and Comcast and everybody simply because you're an athlete and you didn't have to do any work, correct? Oh yeah, that's it. So next? No, um, absolutely not. Um, when I was in high school, I played at South Lakes High School, I played basketball there and if you know Grant Hill, that's the uh, correlation there. Uh, it's Grant Hill High School, so I say all <laughs> but it is what it is. But um, after 10th um, grade, I had to write a, a career paper. And I wanted to, you know, when you're asked that, it makes you think. And, you know, when you're in 10th grade, which some of you may be, because you said it's open to high school students, you know, you really may not know exactly what you want to do. I knew I had a passion for basketball, and I knew I wanted to remain around the game as long as I could. So with that being said, um, before the WNBA was even created, I wrote a paper, my mom still has it, um, <laughs> that said, you know, I want to play in the WNBA if they make it for women. And I'm so serious, and it was like well, well before um, it was created. Day. Yeah, I know. I need to talk to David Stern. The Mega Millions, right there. But, um, but with that, um, you know, I wrote that paper, and I, I had a um, admiration for Cheryl Miller and what she did for the game of women's basketball, and and how after she finished at USC, she carried on her career as a broadcaster. So I saw that it was possible to continue and to stay and maintain yourself around the game by doing that. So. In the paper, the WNBA paper, I also said, after that, I want to be a broadcaster like Cheryl Miller. You know, because I thought it was so awesome that, you know, she was still there and, you know, she was a great player, but then she was still mentoring through setting her own goals for me. So for me, I felt like I want to do that for someone else, um, as well as, you know, live out that, that goal. So um, for me, writing things down has always been a huge key. Um, in terms of setting goals. And it's, it's one thing, you know, I, I think a lot. My mom says I'm an overthinker all the time, and my husband too. But I, I think if you are, are constantly setting goals for yourself, you need to put it on paper. And you need to be able to check it off. And, you know, once you check it off, then write a new one. And, you know, you were talking about the Mega Millions, and you, if you would quit your job, I, I really don't feel like I have a job, per se. I have joy, because I, I set the goals, you know. And with that, you have to be um, proactive. And you're, you're saying you were showered with jobs. That, <laughs> no. Um, you have to make your wishes known. And it, it's one thing to, OK, I have these goals. I have my notebook. I, I've written them down. And you know, where do I go from here? You have to be proactive. You have to make the calls. You have to send the emails. You have to stand behind what you believe is your passion and have a purpose with your passion. You can't just say, oh, I have a passion for this. But you have to stand behind your passion. You have to stand behind it with a purpose, and your purpose is to meet that goal, you know, and then set a new one. And I think w with that in mind, I think that that's how I've been able to, you know, continue to connect the dots within the business. And I didn't make any money at, at first uh, doing any kind of broadcasting. I was working at um, CTV. Channel 76, it's a public access station. Oh, oh somebody. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> somebody did it. Um, but it was a great opportunity, not only to gain experience, but uh, to really understand if that's really what I wanted to do. You know, you find out the ins and outs. When I was a junior here at Maryland, I had an internship with, um, with George Michael and the sports machine at, at NBC and uh, Joe Schreiber and, and all those guys over there um, really, helped me to understand what it took 
in the business. And as an intern, if you've done that yet, um, you will see if you haven't, that you have to um, really have a passion for sports and, and not just basketball. And that's what George mm -hmm. Michael taught me. You can't be, you know, tunnel vision mm -hmm. in terms of your sport. You may be passionate, you may have played basketball, but you can't just be about basketball all the time because he had me logging hockey games, uh, tennis, uh, <laughs> baseball, um, everything, but you had to log every single play. So if, if something happened during that game, you had to highlight it, make sure they pulled it for highlights, and if you mm -hmm. messed up, which I did one time, and I'm not ashamed to tell you, uh -huh. um, there was an overtime, it was a basketball game, it did get a couple basketball games. There was an overtime basketball game, and um, the shot at, it went in at the buzzer, it was actually the one that I logged and I gave him was at the end of the third quarter, mm -hmm. as opposed to the end of the game. Okay, so he called me into the soundproof room. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, love George. I miss him terribly. A sweet, sweet man. But I tell you what, he said, I can't go on air and say that was the shot that went, you know, that took the game to overtime. You need to be specific. You need to be disciplined. And it, it goes back to being an athlete, I think, to be able to take that because I played for, you know, Hall of Fame coach Chris Weller. If you know her and all, like some people may know her up here, she was to the, to the grindstone. Like, you had to work hard. You had to be precise and concise with everything that you're doing. And he was going to go on air with the information that I gave him. So I had to really backtrack. And then he said, you know, are you all right? Did you come to? I said, no, I'm fine. I need to, you know, I need that. I'm, I need to make sure that, that you're doing your job because I have to be, you know, more concise with what I'm doing. So I didn't want him to look bad. But then he came to me after and was like, are you okay? You know, I'm like, absolutely. You know, so you, you number one, you have to have thick skin. Uh, and number two, you have to be dedicated to the details. And you have to follow through with, with what you want out of the position. And, you know, I've just kind of continued to, to meet people, um, to connect with people, and to let them know uh, my wishes um, in terms of the ESPN. That's how that happened with, the, with an email, you know, and follow up, follow up. I also um, broadcast the Mystics games um, during the summer. I'm in studio for um, Comcast Sportsnet for pre and post games for the Washington Wizards. Uh, but just going down um, to the MCI Center, or w w when it was, uh, it was Verizon now, but when it was the MCI Center, and then the, before that, the Capitol Center, to go out there and to be in the midst of players uh, like a Michael Jordan, seriously, when he was with the Bulls, okay, and I was probably one of two females in the locker room, and there were about 50 reporters in there mobbing around him. He, he took, what, an hour to come out sometimes. He would come right to the middle of the locker room. And, you know, if you're not a fighter, if you're not aggressive, especially as a female in, in, a, in a male genre, you're going you're gonna to not be able to get your job done. And for me, I said, okay, everyone's mobbing him. I went all the way around the outside. Somebody stepped on the top of my foot. I still remember, you know, trying to get over here. I got to his left shoulder. And I got my question in, you know, and it got on camera. I, you know, you have to be aggressive. And you can't, I mean, yes, it's Michael Jordan. It's like, oh, Michael Jordan. And you have your moment. But then you have to, <laughs> then you have to get your job done, you know. You have, to, you have to be aggressive and you've got to push through. And I think athletics taught me a lot about um, maintaining that type of mentality in terms of goal setting and following it up with, with passion and purpose. So, thank you. Myrna, what was your goal, and where are you now in reaching that goal? Well, <clears throat> when I stepped on campus here, I think one day my goal was I'm going to be a beat writer for the Yankees, and the next day I'm going to be, you know, the SID from Maryland, and, you know, my goals went all over the place. So I came here, I had a friend back, a family friend back in New York, who, uh, where I grew up, who was a manager for the University of Maryland men's basketball team. He graduated like five years before. So about a week into school, he's like, have you gotten a job yet? And I was like, no, you know, I barely know how to get to class, let alone like, a job. And so he's like, go to the athletics department and get a job. And I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the next he calls two days later. Have you gone to the athletics department and gotten a job yet? And I'm like, no, but I don't even know where Comcast Center is. Like, like leave me alone, like, I'll get a job. And so he um, hangs up the phone, calls me about five minutes later, and says, do you have an appointment with... Troy Wainwright, who at the time was the director of basketball operations, 
to the men's basketball game tomorrow at noon if you have class, skip it, and go to the meeting. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I hang up the phone, get lost. I'm like an hour late for this meeting, like, you know, you know, two or three weeks into my freshman year. I go with a shoddy resume and a journalism major. And he says, all right, well, do you, what do you want to do? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> and he said, well, let me call Mark Frado down. He was the SID for the men's basketball team at the time. And uh, you probably, you're a journalist major, you probably work, want to work in the sports information department. So he comes down, we chat, and he says, we need a student to work on track, to be the track and field sports information director. Do you want to do it? And I was like, mm, okay. So I started working, worked my first football game that Saturday, and that kind of, you know, I, I thought I was going to play club lacrosse. I think the constant theme here is, like, you just want to stay around sports for as long as you can. I wasn't, you know, the athlete that I could have played at Maryland, so I was going to play club. And then I kind of quickly realized that I could play club lacrosse, but then that was going to end in four years. And for to stay around sports for as long as I could, the better decision was to, you know, work and be involved in sports information. So uh, that's what I did, spent four years, and then... Mark Pratt, who hired me, you know, my freshman year, he actually left Maryland, went to St. John's, you know, hired me out of college four years later, you know, worked for him as a graduate assistant for two years, got my master's, kind of worked, like, you know, I think can attest to sports information being one of those, like, seven days a week you're working, you know, men's basketball is great, and then you come off and work a women's basketball game, and then you come off that and work fencing. And you're like, oh. <laughs> but I, you know, learned it's a great, you know, a great foundation because you get, you know, you get to meet so many people both on the business side of the industry and the journalists that cover. You get to, like, make relationships, um, you know, and you can get, like, kind of down and dirty with the sports business. Like, you're, you're doing everything. So uh, after two years there, I grad, you know, it was a two-year program. I graduated. I was kind of planning on staying at St. John's, and you know, turned into another job opportunity, and I'm at CBS um, Sports now. I've been there for almost a year. Um, I work on um, kind of the, like the college sports um, and the sports network, the cable network side of it. Um, I love, you know, what I'm doing. I love, you know, it's kind of like maybe like Sacramento just say, I love the NCAA tournament, obviously I love the SEC football, we've got great sports properties, <clears throat> but um, I found kind of what I didn't expect to love about my job, the cable network side, is, you know, I've kind of gotten the opportunity that I work for this major corporation that has some of the best sports properties in the world on our air, um, but working kind of from the ground up and building a cable network has been so cool. You know, you're involved in everything and um, I really like what I'm doing <clears throat> in communications because you're involved in, you know, you have a meeting with remote production and then studio production and then talent and then creative services. You're really involved in the whole company. You have to know what's going on on the business side, on the air, programming, everything like that. So, so far, it's a short career, but I've liked it so far. It's important as a career. Yeah. yeah. Well, now that uh, I see Jonas is stretching, so uh, I think he's a waste time early. Yeah, it's not quite 11 o'clock yet. Um, but, uh, Jonas, you have not been uh, discouraged um, by any horror stories that you may have heard that actually probably are not true about sports journalism. I mean, you're continuing on. You did some uh, great work um, uh, most recently with your concussion story on, uh, on youth sports uh, in the state of Maryland, which got picked up and, and I don't know if you've noticed, but it's become a um, uh, really trending uh, story nationally now. Uh, Stone Phillips uh, just recently did a, uh, a short documentary on, uh, on uh, youth concussions for, um, uh, for PBS uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, but at any rate, uh, please uh, fill everyone in on uh, your path to studying sports journalism here at the University of Maryland, where you have to go. All right, um, I guess I'll start a lot of high school, so I'll just talk about how I got my start. Um, I was a sophomore just down the road at Blair High School uh, in Silver Spring. Uh, one of the, the, the sports editors came by uh, our journalism class. Um, she was very cute. She said, does anyone want to cover the JV boys basketball team? And I said, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. Um, and, you know, from there, I was like sports. You know, I played soccer competitively for about, you know, 10 12 years. Um, in, in high school, I played soccer, I played basketball, I played lacrosse, and I was also the sports editor, which 
probably the biggest conflict of interest imaginable. <laughs> I did it nonetheless uh, because you know I wanted to be around sports for as long as possible and for as intensely as possible. Um, so you know when I was looking at colleges, I looked at all the great J schools, um, aside on Maryland. Uh, you know I saw just you know what was happening here. I knew just you know, how important it would be to me to kind of be able to afford it and also be close to home. And I knew about the Dimeback, which is what I've kind of you know, dedicated my life to for the past three and a half years. Um, it's a student newspaper here. Um, it's just been a great hands-on opportunity. There's really no kind of substitute for the real thing, and that's what we do. It's real journalism. You're not just kind of you know, doing articles in class. You're actually going out, reporting, meeting interesting people, trying to write interesting stories. And it's kind of, you know, that's basically you know, what I've kind of crafted my you know, journalist the career around just trying to do, you know, one better than, you know, the, the last story I wrote. Um, it, it's frustrating sometimes just because, you know, you're running out of space, you're running out of time, um, but it's just been a blast for me because, you know, one of the kind of mem most memorable nights for us at the dime back, uh, for me personally, was last spring when uh, Gary Williams retired, and I remember going to the newsroom uh, that day at about 3 o'clock thinking, wow, we've already got a couple stories in. Uh, this is going to be an early night. It's going to you know, wrap up things about 10 o'clock, and then I check Twitter. And I see Jeff Goodman reporting that Gary Williams is retiring, and I scream and probably terrify the half the building. Uh, and we ended up working until about 3 o'clock, putting together you know, what we thought was a, a really you know, knockout section, just kind of chronicling everything that Gary had done in his 20 or so years. And you know, it was stressful, but it was also so, so much fun because. You were just kind of recounting everything that, uh, for me, a guy who I you know, just kind of idolized growing up, was able to do and not do in his career. And you know, I woke up at nine o'clock the next morning after about four or five hours of sleep to go to the actual press conference. And I mean, I was tired, sure, but it was just the, the kind of next logical step for for me to go kind of cover this this next step uh, in this legendary career. Um, so. I was tired and I had to go play, go play basketball after that, after against WNBC, which we lost, which was not fun. <laughs> but it was still, it was still a, you know, a great night, um, you know, one that kind of just attested to how much I loved the, the field, how much I enjoyed working on it, and how much I kind of do want to continue um, my progress in it. Great. That's as close to a real experience as you're going to get. That's the greatest advertising I just heard to go to Maryland. <laughs> he, that's what you're going to, if you're going to do this for a career, that's what you're going to do. And the fact that he did this in college is pretty remarkable. That's, that's an experience you can't get in many places. Jonas, what's your grade point? Uh, it's about 3-8. Short. 3-8. 3 Well, let me ask uh, let me ask Liz one question. Um, what would be the uh, one quality or skill that a sports journalist needs coming into the business today that they needed when you started, uh -huh. and what's the one skill or quality that person needs today coming into the business that you probably didn't need or even think right. about when you were coming? In? I love that question. Um, I love that question. <laughs> um, let me let me invert them though, and okay. I've been thinking about this, and and you guys can probably answer the second part of that yourselves. But that is, you really need to be totally conversant with new media. You need um, to know how to use Twitter, use. Facebook as a reporting tool, you know, say news breaks, you have no time, you have to locate a person, you know, and when I began, you get out the yellow pages, and like, are they listed, and that's kind of about it, but you need to know all the different ways available to you to, to locate people, to background yourself in the news. Um, when I started, if you were assigned a story and you needed to do research, you'd go to the library in the newspaper and pull actual clippings of yellowed old papers and just read old stories. So it's, it blows my mind, you know, how much information is at your disposal if you're deaf and smart about cruising around the internet. And I bet you guys would just put me to shame at how adept you are. I'm not so good at this. Um, but if you are, 
that really gives you a leg up in hiring, in presenting yourself, and telling someone, you know, I'm, I, I'm conversant with all this. Um, and, and unless I get better at it, I may be a dinosaur out the window. So that is, we can't understate the importance of that. And you probably take it for granted, but it's a big deal um, if you know how to use all the exploding new media and stay one step ahead of it. And also, say you have a beat, you're covering Maryland's men's basketball team, covering any team. You kind of want to get the Twitter handles of everybody you cover, or their Facebook things, just to monitor. I mean, not to be like a stalker or anything. <laughs> but, you know, more and more athletes are breaking their own news. Like, I'm ticked off at the coach, or I need more playing time. A little tweet like that can be a huge story on your beat. And you want to be aware of it. You don't want an editor to come to you and say, uh, I heard this happen. Um, so that's all in the new realm. The thing that I've also been thinking about is, is what are the core principles and the core values and the core things you need as a journalist that to me are timeless. Um, and that is, you know, a natural curiosity a natural skepticism. I mean, when you read the paper, whatever, whatever somebody's telling you, whether on TV or in the paper, read it with a critical eye. Question it. Does this make sense? What part is it told? Gee, I wonder this. You know, always have a critical mind, and I mean critical in the positive sense, not criticizing people, but questioning, questioning. So have an active mind. Come up with your own ability to come up with your own story ideas. Um, but then, this may sound obvious, but it's scary how often it, it's ignored. And that is honesty and the ability to build relationships and build trust. I mean, this notion of getting a scoop sounds really sexy and great. But if you get a scoop by deceiving someone, tricking someone, you know, pulling a fast one, misrepresenting yourself, that's a one story, and you'll never talk to that person again. I mean, that your relationship is tarnished. And um, I sort of want to go into the Watergate question, but I'll, I'll save that for later. But there, you know, not every story exists on the internet. In other words, when you do your research, you want to read everything that's out there. But as the reporter, you want to advance what's already known. You want to bring something new to the table. So you need the ability to read everything that's out there, but get your own information, get your own insights. So that not only means don't copy somebody else's work, you know, don't, don't poach what somebody else has written, but set up the interviews. Um, there's nothing, for all the technology that's there that's great, nothing will replace a face-to-face -face interview. I mean, once you meet somebody face to face, my name is Liz, I work for the Washington Post, you sit down with somebody, they're going to tell you more than they would by phone or, or more than you would find by reading their bio. Um, so I guess what I'm talking about is a personal integrity, uh, intellectual curiosity, um, and an emotional intelligence, which is don't be afraid to meet people, introduce yourself. And by the way, if you make a mistake in a story, go to the athlete and say, I'm sorry, I mischaracterized the play. I had you blowing the play, and I didn't realize it was your teammate that blew the play. Do you know what I mean? And, and you can make mistakes, but if you want to build sustaining relationships, stand up, you write something critical, don't hide, you know, be available for criticism that comes back, and if you make a mistake, apologize and explain why. So. And other panelists, be, feel free to uh, jump in at any time. I was going to ask Mr. High Tech, uh, Andy Poli, um, one of the most voracious uh, consumers of sports uh, uh, news that I know um, in all mediums, what's the biggest change that you've seen um, during your career, or maybe just in, let's say, the last 10 years? Or just, just listening to Liz scare the hell out of me, because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, not as, I'm not as up on it as, as she is, but you I'm need to be. And, be, and feel hard. free also to share your Twitter, your Twitter handle. Yeah, I, 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 ha, I don't have a Twitter handle, and I'm going to need one because it, it's moving. Liz, Liz mentioned Watergate, and Watergate for you guys is probably like 
when I was a kid watching Fred Flintstone carve on the stone tablets. But um, that was that came out. The movie came out the year I graduated high school. All the President's Men. And if you haven't seen it, you should probably see it. Uh, not that it's representative of journalism today, but I think it's representative of how things have changed so dramatically. Two guys from the Washington Post, two legendary reporters, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, uh, basically ran the story themselves for six months, George. What, what was, I mean, it was, it was a period of time they owned it. You couldn't do that now. Um, they had their, their sore, steep throat, and all the news would wait till the next day's paper. <laughs> Not today. I mean, there's, there's tweets, there's guys, you know, Matt Drudge changed a lot of things for the internet. There's things coming out on the internet overnight, and, and not overnight, but, but minute by minute. So the way that story advanced in a daily newspaper would never happen now. And what Liz was just talking about is exactly the way we're going now. And when you guys get to be our age, God knows how you're going to be getting your news and putting out the news, because it's changing so incredibly fast. For example, you know, when I do a, a radio show, uh, we have a website for the, for the station that says that, for example, Kevin Blackstone will be on the show, which is a couple times a month. But they now would like me to uh, tweet, hey, you know, in one hour, Kevin's on. Uh, and, and, and during a commercial break, they'll like say, you know, Kevin just said that, you know, he thinks that, that baseball should be abolished. I'm not going to say that. But, but that's, that's the minute by minute, the second by second. And what Liz said about athletes breaking news on Twitter, that's exactly the way it is. It's, it's so crazy now that the NFL, I think two years ago, uh, had to ban players from tweeting during games because, you know, like, you know, T.O. could go in the locker room at halftime and say, they're not getting me the ball enough. And, and while the game's still being played, there's, there's news being made by T.O. I mean, that's, that's the way things are right now. So what you have to learn when you get out is, is you've got to learn everything. If, if you want to be in radio, you got to learn how to do TV, and you got to learn how to write, and you got to learn how to consume news. Everybody's doing everything now. Uh, Kevin does all three. Liz does radio, probably some TV, too. Uh, I, I blog. I do a little bit of television, uh, a lot of radio. That's the way things are now. So, so it's, it's a global thing. Nobody really does just one thing anymore, and nobody gets their news in any one way anymore. You have to get it in all ways. Anybody else want to... Yeah, you know, if sure I could just, um, uh, just piggyback on a couple of um, the comments, I think that um, it's a good thing that, you know, there's so many uh, ways to get the message out there, to tell the story with new media and with social media. Everyone's a journalist, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have a cell phone, you have a, a camera phone and all of that. Um, I'm kind of a dinosaur. I'm old school. And I think that there's, there's a place, um, and there will always be a place, to remember the old school and or the timeless virtues and or the essentials in, in life, in any profession. And what with with, with those include for me, and I know Liz just spoke a little bit about it, is integrity. So no matter what business you're in, and certainly as a journalist, as a communications professional, it's about trust, it's about integrity, it's about telling the truth, it's about being honest. Because what that does is it dovetails very nicely into relationships. And in any business, whether it's sales, Marketing, journalism, communications, cultivating relationships and having relationships is really where you're going to find your success. Because people buy from people they like, people donate uh, money to people that they like and to organizations that um, they, they trust, and people tell stories to journalists that they trust. Um, so it's really all about being a person of integrity, telling the truth and never, never um, dismissing your values and having a strong moral code. The other thing I'd like to mention is, um, you know, as a mom, I have a 17-year-old, so I have a daughter who's in high school, and she's looking at colleges right now. She's a junior at the Bullis School. Um, I am constantly, and my students know this as well, I'm constantly reminding her of the importance, not only in school and academics, but in life, of writing. Writing is so important, and I think with social media, what it's done is, I'm, this is my, the way I'm diagnosing it, is that, you know, we are, I'm saying that kids are not writing as well anymore, and I think a lot of it does have to do with social media, because it's IDK, OMG, LOL, and all that, and it drives me crazy, and I'm like, write it out, you know, so my daughter, I'm like, you know, IDK, so you know how to put an apostrophe, D -O, you know, it's like, you know, write it out, and I think because of how everything is so quick and so fast, everyone's doing things with 140 characters or less, 
that we're forgetting the basics. And writing, especially for journalism students, or those of you who are interested in journalism, and clearly in every, every other industry and endeavor, you've got to write. You've got to write your resume. You've got to write a thank you note. You've got to um, write you know, uh, emails that are very nicely crafted. And because it's an email, doesn't mean that you can, you can misspell. There is no reason with technology that there are misspellings, and even with grammar. I mean, there, you know, I think there's things now that, that find grammatical errors. So please don't forget the very basics in writing. Know how to write no matter what you all do. Um, so I just wanted to kind of mention that. Absolutely. And I would say, if you don't have this book, go get it. You can get it used, you can get it new. It'll never change. It's, called, it's by Strunk and White. It's called The Elements of Style. Everything you ever want to know about writing, Answered in this short little text. I've been carrying these around with me forever. You can see this one stain. Uh, I don't know what that is. But, I, um, did, I second that. I've got like gone through three copies in 30 exactly. years. And I don't know why they don't do these like leather bound. You know, keep them for life. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a great thing. It's available or like online now. <laughs> <laughs> no, a contact lens implant. You can constantly be reading the book mm -hmm. as you write. It's, yeah. it's, it's a great, it's like a map to, and it's, the thesis of the book is that fancy is not necessarily right. good. Right. It's about clean, so, yeah, right. clear, declarative, fitting, speaking to this writing. That's powerful writing. Absolutely. Yeah. I just want to add, just really briefly, um, just what everyone has been saying, just about um, really expanding your your knowledge of of more than just one idea of what you think media is and. And with that being said, the Twitter thing with um, Shaquille O'Neal announcing his retirement on Twitter, I mean, that's huge, you know, and I mean, that literally in things, yeah. but, um, but with that, you, you have to, I had to get on Twitter because I, I was finding I was missing out on, you know, the news stories, not, you know, what you had for lunch stories, and that's the, you know, but the news stories, they hit right away, and you need to know that, and you were saying like to find the, the Twitter handles of mm -hmm. the players, and as a color analyst, that's huge for me because if someone is injured, they may not, you know, say everything, you know, face to face. But sure. on Twitter, it's like, man, I'm still on these crutches. I'm in a yes. boot, and they'll update you, you know, when the SID won't tell you something, so you can find out things that that you can use, well, that I could use, like within a game, the details that they wouldn't really divulge to you uh, personally, but. And uh, another note, just to have that personal relationship, like for the hours that I spend, you know, prepping for games, which is huge, um, to have done your homework. And I think that's the biggest thing if you're looking to be a color analyst or, uh, or, or you know, someone like Kevin, to a person that has to have the information, you have to do your homework. And, you know, with the, the internet, I don't know how people prepared for games prior to right. the internet. Seriously, because they have game notes, they have everything is online, so it's just really right there. It's just you have to get it done. Yeah. So you have to go through everything, but on game day, I get there two or three hours early to talk to the coaches, to talk to the you know the top <laughs> players or, or the players that may have a role in, in the game that day, and I find out more than, what, in 10 minutes, I find out more than what I need to know, and I find out more than I found out with the hours prepping prior to the game just by having that kind of conversation with them. And, and then that trust is yeah. built there. And then when you see them next time, they'll be you know, mm -hmm. giving you more information mm -hmm. because they have that prior uh, experience with you and, and that respectability. So I think that goes a long way also. And with that, just very quickly, I found as a reporter, I mean, kind of by definition, any athlete you cover has achieved at a level you and I never will. I mean, they're, they're generally the most disciplined, hard-working, driven people, no matter what sport, they are getting it done, and they put in untold hours. And believe it or not, they take note of the journalists who show up two hours early and are prepared and ask the questions. I mean, as a sports writer, you never want to try to fake that you are an athlete, too. You're not, you know. But you can <laughs> be disciplined. You know, and, and athletes respect that. Um, Maria, which year did you get out? 2008. 2008. Jonas, you're getting in now. How, how um, comfortable and versatile were you when you graduated with video and audio uh, to go along with your writing skills? And then I want Jonas to talk about what he's 
done and what he will leave with? Um, my senior year, I took a class um, called Non-Print Media for the Print Major, I think was the name of the class. And it was like, I mean, how long the semester? I don't know, 12 weeks or whatever? It was four weeks learning how to use digital camera and Photoshop. Four weeks with a digital audio recorder and trying to um, learn radio. And uh, four weeks with a video camera and trying to learn how to edit. So that was... Um, that was sort of, I mean, we, we knew how important that kind of thing was, and we knew, I mean, got it, like, it's only four years right. ago, but, you know, we knew the importance of it. Flip cams had just come out, and, you know, like, reporters were, were coming. We had three great professors who were, um, one was a reporter at the Washington Post, um, started as a print reporter, and was doing video for WashingtonPost.com, and just talking about how, you know, print reporters, newspaper reporters were now taking flip cams, and they were in charge of doing video and, you know, um, and all that stuff. So we knew the importance um, of it, but I, um, you know, and I was, you know, really well-rounded, but there's not, there's nothing like really, you know, getting into it. So I think that my classmates who did, um, who did, you know, took more advantage of the journalism side, whether it was WMUC or the Dimebeck and stuff like that, um, they were much more well-rounded than I was, and then I was kind of thrown into the fire when I graduated. When I went to St. John's, we started streaming our non-televised games online, and um, I kind of became in charge of that, and I <laughs> did not know what I was doing, but I learned, you know? And I think that was the importance of the, you were constantly prepared, and you were expected at, you, at Maryland, you were expected to, you know, to figure it out, and that you were prepped that that was, that was going to happen. You have to accept it, and you can't say, well, no, 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 like, that's, I'm a print journalism major, like, I'm not doing that. So, uh, so that's kind of where, you know. And four years later, Jonas? Yeah, I mean, like, just to you know, echo what she said, um, it's important to, to have a knowledge of the different skills, but again, like, also, technology just makes it so much easier for, for me, for, for anyone. I mean, like, I do so much stuff on my iPhone, and I can do so much mm -hmm. more. I check Twitter religiously, uh, just kind of piggybacking up what we were talking about earlier, to know how, like, how to use Twitter and to, to realize the value that it holds. I mean, you can, you know, if you're an aspiring journalist, you can kind of connect with professional established ones. Uh, if you're a working journalist, uh, you know, you can kind of, you know, suss out stories and, uh, you know, I mean, Liz, you were there for when Terrell Stoglin spouted <laughs> off after, after the Duke loss. That became yeah, the storyline. And then there's also just kind of a, a great resource on Twitter just for finding stories that you will like and that you can kind of use to improve your own skill. You know, uh, long form, uh, the long form hashtag has great examples of journalism that are always you know, fun to read. I can always teach you something. And then, I mean, you know, phones can record audio, they can do video, they can take pictures. So, I mean, you know, we're supposed to be some one man band, but fortunately we have some pretty good technology that allows us to do that. That, that's vitally important. Um, uh, those of you who watch golf, Bill McAtee, he's a big deal with uh, CBS. When I had my first job in Beaumont, Texas, he was doing TV there, and this is 1978, and it was such a small station, he was shooting his own video. Well, it's coming full circle, because most people who are going to become TV reporters are going to have to shoot their own video now. The technology is so simple that everybody's going to have handheld cameras, these type of news crews. There'll be some for, for big big interviews and things like that, but uh, it's, it's all stuff that you've got to learn. It's all, the, the tech, don't be afraid of the technology. Don't be like me. Uh, <laughs> you gotta, you got to learn how to do this stuff because it's going gonna, it's gonna to make or break your career down the road. Can I take some questions? Anyone about anything for our panel? I have a question. Jonas, what's the job search been like? Uh, I mean, I, I haven't paid an internship for the summer, so I can't really complain. Uh, after that, who knows? Um, I like the track record of places that have interned at, how they've been able to, to place people in full-time jobs. So I'm just, uh, you know, going to cross that, that, that bridge when I come to it. But uh, Jeremy, who I work with at the, at the dime back, already has a, a job uh, lined up for after graduation. Um, so some of the people who worked with us in previous years have had jobs in the field mm -hmm. that, they, that they really like. So, you know, again, 
talk to us. We were all where you are right now, and scared to death of these people who we thought were big shots, and they're really just us. So talk to us, email us, call us. Uh, you've got to give back. So people helped us along the way. And the internships are vitally important. Yeah. Vital. I mean, if you're, going, if you're coming to school, don't, don't go in four years, have a great time, have a great time. But at the end of four years, say, oh, yeah, I really should have gotten an internship. Yeah, you should have. You should have gotten three of them. One in TV, one in radio, one in newspaper. Incredibly important because it's not just what you learn being around people, but it's who you meet, who you know. These people move on. They go to other places, and you've got an automatic entree with them, and that's going to lead you to a job.